the uh, very first panel discussion of the the program uh, and of the event uh, happening right now. And we're essentially going to set the scene of what we mean when we are talking about the skills revolution and the level of readiness for it. So I read such a wonderful comment uh, about the skills revolution. And uh, it was a, a likening to how individuals would prepare when they know that a hurricane is coming. I come from a part of the world I don't think I've experienced. In fact, I haven't experienced a hurricane before. But I know that in other parts of the world, when there is a notification from the weather service to say that this adverse weather event, this hurricane is happening, uh, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it. So individuals, what I've seen, uh, particularly on the movies that I've watched, individuals will uh, make sure that their windows are insulated, the doors are insulated, they've got sufficient blankets, they've got sufficient food, probably for the, um, the shed in which they will be staying in uh, while the hurricane is, 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 is ongoing. Um, they're, they're adequately prepared. What is also notable and what I've also seen is that uh, in the event where uh, that strong weather event is happening, there's a certain level of community spirit that is involved as well. There's a, a level of making sure that the rest of the community, your neighbor knows what is happening, that the elderly in the community and the kids in the community are also uh, well prepared and uh, protected so that when that hurricane eventually does come, although it will cause destruction, that's a fact, because of the level of preparedness that uh, has gone in anticipating it, the uh, level of damage and uh, destruct destruction is limited. And what that also means is that once the wind eventually blows over, the uh, repair work of the homes and all the damage that uh, resulted as a result of the hurricane is limited because of preparedness. And why I use the analogy of a hurricane is because there's a force, a really strong force being driven by technology, being driven by climate, being driven by uh, economic shocks like the COVID-19 pandemic, and even to a very large extent, the war that we're currently seeing in the Ukraine, there's a force that's coming that is going to revolutionize the labor market. It's already underway, as we heard from the head of the World Skills Organization, and uh, it's an unstoppable one that is going to overthrow the current system, the current status quo. So the question is, what kind of tools do we need to make sure that when the force does come and the wind eventually blows over, that the level of damage that it does cause is limited as much as possible, such that the displacement that is caused to some individuals who may lose their job as a result of this revolution, as a result of this force, is limited to such a way that they're re repositioning in the new world, whatever the new labor market looks like, is easier to do. And so I'm looking forward to your insights on what you think some of these tools that we can sharpen are right now, particularly for those of you who responded quite confidently in the poll saying that you had anticipated the revolution, there is a level of preparedness that you do have uh, going underway and uh, that uh, you feel that you will be uh, uh, well insulated to the change, from the change that the revolution does bring. And I hope that you'll share those tools with us on the uh, comment section in the chat as you have been doing and also pose any questions to the uh, speakers whom I'm about to introduce you to right now. Beginning with uh, Mr. Bernardo Calzadilla Sarmiento, who is the uh, director of the Division of Fair Production, Sustainability Standards and Trade at Unido. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Wonderful. We also have Antonio Andrioni. He is the uh, Professor of Development and Economics at SOAS, University of London. Hi, Antonio. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, wonderful. Luca, also with us, Mark Colin, economist at the OECD Directorate for Employment, Labor and Social Affairs. Hi to you, Luca. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. Uh, we have Francesca Rosso, the human capital development expert, a coordinator for a skills demand analysis at the European Training uh, Foundation. Good Happy morning, everybody. Wonderful. Um, we also have Kirsten Schuttler, project lead of the German Federal Enterprise, the GIZ. How's it, we say, in my part of the world, Kirsten? Everything great. Thanks so much. And good morning to everyone. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. And last but not least, Ilrika Hessling-Stjostrom. 
She is the Senior Program Manager at CEDA. Hi, Ulrika. Hi, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everybody. Nice to be here. Thank you. Yes, yes. so we have a, a quite a big panel uh, weighing in on quite a big uh, topic. And so, Bernardo, uh, in fact, uh, Francesca, let me begin with you, because I read somewhere that uh, this is the decade of action. And right now it is a known fact that there's around uh, a 1.1 billion jobs uh, that we have today that we will not have in the next 10 years because of the fact that uh, these jobs will be displaced by technology. So in addressing the skills revolution and the reskilling emergency that we are facing right now, let's define what we mean by resilience, especially resilience as it does pertain to skills. Francesca, your uh, understanding of the word resilience. Thank you very much, Fifi, for this question, um, and which in fact uh, allows me to refer to uh, joint work we are conducting at the European Training Foundation with the Interagency Group on Skills Anticipation and Matching, exactly on resilience. We are putting together our experiences to see uh, how can we best learn from what has happened during the pandemic to generate, to develop a labor market and skill system which are more resilient. And when drafting, when working on the paper, we exactly uh, question, we ask ourselves what was the meaning of resilience in the context of labor market and skill system. And we found several definitions with word that refer to recover, adapt, rebound from adversity. The 2020 European Commission Strategic Foresight Reports re defines resilience as the ability not only to withdraw and cope with challenge, but also to undergo transitions in a sustainable, fair and democratic manner. And ultimately, what we have uh, used as a definition in the interagency group paper is uh, uh, resilience as the capacity to rebuild better, more robust and inclusive labor markets. In other words, resilience is really understood as the ability to bounce back stronger and to grow from adversity. And as you can see, this narrative really takes a, a sort of multidisciplinary approach, a 360 degrees approach, and it sets the basis for a long term strategic objective as part of an agenda that look into the future while learning from the past and from the present. But then we ask ourselves, what have we seen in the past and in the present? And I here want to pass two main messages. The first is about crisis and the second one is about uncertainty. So first one, crisis. The COVID-19 first, but then also the aggression of Russia to Ukraine. And nowadays, uh, the energy and the food crisis have shown us that new crises are likely to emerge. They are of an unforeseeable nature. And there is also a combination of uh, a climate degradation and uh, societies with increasing inequalities, deep economic interconnection that make the world in which we live much more vulnerable than in the past. Crises are permanent. We are in the era of the perma crisis as they, as they have been defined. And in this circumstances, ensuring the resilience of societies is crucial. But we don't have resilient societies if we don't have resilient individual citizens. And citizens can become resilient if they are also supported by institutions and by uh, policies. And the second message I want to pass is about uncertainty. You know, when we talk with the stakeholders in the countries where we work, they all tell us that the future for them and for their country is uncertain. And it's about its uncertainty for individuals, for companies and for institutions themselves. For, institution, for, for individuals, it's about navigating from one job to another, for young people to enter the labor market, to remain relevant in the labor market. For the companies, is actually to navigate about the, through the transition, revising their value proposition, also developing new business models that are able to grant their survival in an economic context which is dramatically changed. 
compared to the past. And for institutions, the challenge is really to ensure equitable policies that can um, prepare people and countries to absorb shocks that nobody can really foresee today. And this implies that if a crisis hit, the infrastructure is there and the country can activate this infrastructure quickly. So you can see that in this context, skills development and lifelong learning play a fundamental role now but more than ever before, because skills are really essential to ensure that individuals and societies are able to navigate into these changing contexts, changing labor market. And ultimately, they really serve as the best buffer in uncertain times. So you asked me in the beginning about a definition, and I want to close with that. Um, it's actually resilience is really uh, showing an opportunity to bounce forward. I talked before about bounce back. It's actually bounce forward toward a better future, toward a better system, um, which is a better system from economic, from a social and from an environmental point of view. I would like to say it's not much to think out of the box. It's really rather about uh, be reshaping a new box. All right. Uh, reshaping a new box and bouncing forward into it. Nice one. Antonio, your uh, understanding of uh, resilience and perhaps the question is its application. Because at a high level, we know that it's about being able to be dynamic and to innovate and to be able to uh, resist against uh, economic headwinds, be it in the form of a pandemic, be it in the form of a, a weather challenge, be it in the form of a revolution that's coming and that's been driven by digital change. But how do you see a skills resilience and how do you see the framework that we should follow either at a policy level, we should follow to implement resilience according to your understanding of what it is. Thanks, Fifi. Thanks. And this is a very important conversation. I will draw on some of the work that actually I had the chance to do with UNIDO uh, for the last industrial development report, where we've been actually trying to address some of these questions, also working with governments across the global south and in general, try to understand uh, you know, this link that Francesca has already nicely uh, uh, spelled out, which is the link between resilience and all sorts of extreme events, crisis. And what I would like to start from is to uh, you know, stress the fact that you know, many of these crises are unexpected, but uh, we at the same time know that are becoming more frequent. And to a certain extent, we know that all the time they emerge, they create new demands, they create new form of pressure on institutions, organizations, labor markets, and so on. And so the, the question is, how do we actually look at this uh, problem, not simply from one crisis after the other, but actually at the systemic level, how we think about how to enhance the uh, re resilience, the structural resilience of societies, economies, institutions, knowing that when these things hit, uh, we don't know when they hit, but they know when they're going to hit and often hit together, they create a very compressed policy setting, right? Where policymakers need to deal with, at the same time, with multiple demands and new demands that often are unexpected. And this, of course, pose new trade-off. Uh, in some cases, this trade-off can be managed uh, effectively. Uh, in some others are actually showing and eating on those countries which have further vulnerabilities. So we know that things like COVID are eating as much as the climate change, are making having disproportional impact across countries, society, social groups. So we need to be uh, aware of the fact that solution will not come from siloed approach on individual problems or crisis, but actually how to turn this trade off in opportunities for making the systemic level uh, the uh, societies and economies more resilient. And so let me start giving some example, concrete example that maybe can actually help us in this in this space. First of all, we have seen that there has been a very diverse response to the COVID crisis. And this heterogeneity partially uh, from the studies we have been conducting comes from the fact that you need very different type of capabilities to address, if you want, the early stages of a crisis, the so-called robustness to shock, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the readiness to change that is required to actually rebuild. And these different skills and capabilities are, in fact, highly distributed across different actors. So I would say, you know, we need to uh, embrace an idea of resilience as something that is systemic and is distributed. Distributed means that 
no organization, either the private sector or the public sector, can face any of these crises alone. There is a problem of uh, how to coordinate the effort among these different uh, uh, players. Uh, and, and we have seen that countries who have been in very specific areas, we have seen success and failures in all countries in the responses to the pandemic. Uh, but those who have been able to uh, be successful in specific areas are those who are able to actually make this connection between public and private sector capabilities in a more effective way. So let me give you an example. Brazil had a massive hit in terms of the management of the pandemics. But at the same time, when we look at their capacity to scale up manufacturing capabilities in the context of vaccine manufacturing, we see a very successful story. So a story where the existence of capabilities across foundations like few crudes and other uh, foundations that were very much linked to this public-private relationship between the procurement of drugs, the production of drugs, the innovation for new vaccine, and on top of that, the government interventions at the, all levels of governance with industrial policy have made that country capable to double their vaccine manufacturing capabilities and to prepare for the next potential crisis, having more flexible manufacturing uh, uh, capabilities to use uh, to basically different technologies, vector type uh, 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 or MRA type of technologies. So this is just an example which also point to the fact that among these capabilities, industrial capabilities are very important. We have shown in the report with you know, econometric evidence that in fact, countries which have been more resilient are also those that had more distributed industrial capabilities. Because of course, industrial capabilities are instrumental uh, if we think about the health industry complex, to manufacture those type of things that we need uh, at speed in the moment of crisis. As much as now we are seeing in the climate change situation, countries who are able to be part, not just as consumer, but as producer and innovators in the context of renewable technologies, adaptation of technologies and so on, are also those that uh, are far ahead in that, in that uh, building of resilience. We have also learned that resilience is about redundancies. We have been for many years uh, emphasizing efficiency and streamlining of value chains and so on. But we are realizing that sometimes having redundancies in some or part of these uh, infrastructures and value chains and firms, it's also important to be able to uh, scale up responses at the moment of crisis. And so in, in a sense, we need to think about uh, how do we, uh, as a society, create this uh, uh, insurance policy uh, by creating redundancies in skill institutions, in companies, in public sector uh, facilities. And let me conclude with some more specific uh, reflection on redundancies also in the context of skills. Now, when we think about skills, uh, we know we talk a lot about individual skills. We talk a lot about how especially young people, women can be more involved in training and the development of STEMs, in particular, a specific type of science, technology, uh, maths related skills. But in many cases, especially in low middle income countries, uh, we need to work on the way in which these vocational training institutions are able to deliver quality training, but also we need to work on more collective type of skills. Ultimately, we have lots of talented, skilled people across the global south, but their capacity to contribute to resilience, to productivity, to innovation depends on the extent to which also there are companies, organizations, both in the public and private sector, who are able to employ their skills in an effective way. So my message here is we need to really reflect on how we think about resilience in a systemic way, but also how we think about how to train not just people, but also to train organizations, develop more agile, more robust organizations that are able to uh, uh, actually deploy skill effectively. And this is the big challenge in many low middle income countries. We need to think carefully about not just the supply of skills, but also the quality of the demand for skills. What kind of firms are these firms able to deploy skills, new technologies in an effective way? Are they able to valorize that relationship with the vocational training institution? And only by working at this interface, we can really start seeing uh, a change happening. And there are good demonstration pockets of efficiency across the global south we can build on exactly at this interface between firms, organizational capabilities development, and on the other end, uh, uh, vocational training institution. I'll stop there. Thanks. Right. All right. No, thank you. Uh, just that point, uh, the emphasis on not only the supply of the skills, but also the quality uh, thereof. And it's uh, wonderful to see the response coming in from the, uh, the chat. 
uh, on their different perspectives of resilience, resilience being perseverance and the ability to forge ahead irrespective of life's changes, according to Peter Chikuku, uh, Niels Schultz, talking about the fact that uh, responsibility is key for resilience in the sense of understanding the challenge and ability to react and learn from it. And uh, we also had a really nice uh, contribution from Katija, Khadija Abdi, uh, who did say resilience is the ability to withstand any difficulties and bounce back solutions. Kirsten, your opening uh, uh, remark though on uh, resilience, and particularly when we talk about resilience in uh, fragile settings, settings in which individuals are experiencing war in their country or some form of uh, displacement, settings in which uh, you have a large a grouping of people who are marginalized or excluded from the ability to fully uh, adapt and be agile, as it were. You will take on resilience and the importance of resilience being inclusive. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Fifi. And I want to zoom in on, on the question of digital labor platforms as a means where people can integrate the economy and have low entry barriers, but where we also see obstacles and where we can somewhat see the future of work under a magnifying glass and where we can get a glimpse of what the future of work is likely to look like also in, in other areas of the economy. So on these platforms, short-term jobs, so-called gigs are mediated online. The work is either also done online, so that can be web design or labeling of pictures or other types of tasks, or the services are delivered in a specific location, so think Uber and the like. Um, there are a number of estimates out there, very conservative estimates think that at least 70 million people worldwide already earn part or their entire income in this so-called gig economy, of which at least 40 million people are in the low and middle income countries. So it's a truly global phenomenon that we see here and the num numbers are growing rapidly. And as I said, these digital labor platforms can play an important role in job creation in different environments. They provide flexibility and lower entry barriers with regards to the job market, and they allow disadvantaged groups like migrants, women, refugees, and others to enter the labor market. At the same time, the, con the working conditions of gig workers do often not fulfill the standards of decent work. So the gig economy is not just a sector, but rather a phenomenon that gives us a better idea of the future of work and presents new dynamics on the labor market. And it's interesting to zoom in and to see what resilience means in this context, as we see that there are certain trends here that are likely to affect other types of work as well in the future. So against this background, it's interesting to look at this closer. Um, what does resilience mean for workers in this gig economy on these digital labor platforms? So for them, resilience really is key because the gig economy is in a constant state of flux and therefore workers need to grow resilience to succeed. And when they are resilient, they are able to enter and move into the gig economy and use the fact that entry barriers are low. They're also able to perform in the gig economy and move out of the gig economy when needed um, by leveraging their skill sets in a way that opens up opportunities for them while also coping with the many challenges that exist. So skills are really the currency in the gig economy. It is the skills of the workers that are offered a service uh, via, via those platforms. Um, it is therefore important to support the workers with frameworks that enhance their capability as well as their bargaining power on these platforms. So resilience first and foremost for these workers means the ability to adapt to change. A gig worker needs to constantly adapt to change and upskill or reskill more regularly than others. They constantly have to adapt uh, to customer, de customer demand and also conditions on these platforms that are likely to change. In our research, gig workers have reported that they're interested in undertaking upskilling programs. However, most require guidance and trainings that have relevance for their specific labor market. This is why at GIZ, on behalf of our Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, we are working on developing such guidance and trainings for acquiring specific skills that are in demand. 
Resilience in the gig economy also means the ability to transfer and combine skills. Um, so gig workers either delivering services on location or via the cloud require adequate soft skills and other complementary skills, not only for good customer relations and interactions, but also for managing the platform, managing the fact that most of them are contractors, managing the algorithms that guide their work. So such skills are desirable because they're value adding to the skills, the technical skills the workers have, and because they're transferable. At GIZ, we're developing and piloting soft skills trainings and other complementary trainings on digital skills, financial management, negotiation, etc., that can help these workers better navigate the gig economy. And in doing so, we are collaborating with the private sector and the public sector. Resilience also means skills anticipation because we see very rapid changes in the gig economy on the skills that are actually in demand. And it is important for workers as well as for companies and policymakers to get a better idea of what the skills in demand are. And one example is that at GIZ, we're working on a skill compass for online work to allow workers to find out which skills it makes most sense for them to acquire next and to inform companies and policymakers about which skills are in demand and where trainings need to be offered. And fourth and last, uh, on digital la labor platforms, resilience also means leveraging networks because gig work often offers few opportunities to interact with others. Workers need to exploit existing opportunities and be offered additional ones, uh, much more than in the, in the classical workplace. And especially women, migrants and refugees and other more vulnerable workers need support systems that can facilitate their participation in the platform economy, as well as offer useful advice on coping mechanisms. And this is why at GIZ, we are working on developing mentoring groups and networking opportunities for gig workers, for example, in Kenya, with a specific focus on women and refugees. So we see, as I said, we see the, the, the need for networks. We see the need to anticipate skills. We see the need for complementary skills, and we see the need to constantly adapt to change, for workers to be resilient and be able to adapt and bounce forward, um, as Francesca said, in, um, in the gig economy, be able to succeed and also be able to move out when, it, when it's better for, for their income and their earnings. Mm -hmm. I think that's... Uh, that's um... Some fascinating uh, research you've drawn on just looking at the labor market right now that is said to be the labor market of the future and is, is, is growing in prominence all over the world, the uh, gig economy. So just understanding resilience through what has happened to these workers who continually have to adapt uh, given the changes that, uh, that do follow in, in the economy. But in this adaptation and... Uh, bouncing forward. I'm just wondering, you know, to an extent who foots the bill of, you know, constantly anticipating these skills that will be required and getting these skills that will be in demand. Perhaps something that the panel can uh, comment on as, as we continue the discussion. But Ulrika, your your take on uh, resilience as, as is seen through the work that CEDA does. Ma'am, I believe you are on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I start again. Thank you very yes. much. Uh, I, what I was saying is that today when we have the ongoing conflicts, we have the, the, uh, the war in Ukraine, as you mentioned, and we are in the post-COVID situation. It's so important. I mean, it's always been uh, important to build resilience, both in organizations and in systems, and, and but also in the individuals. And this is strongly something that CEDA believes in. And this is also why we support the LKDF, uh, since the CEDA vision puts the the person, the individual in the center for everything. And we also in the uh, LKDF facility uh, framework, we work with a market system uh, approach. And, and by doing that, you, you, you build opportunities and support financing initiatives uh, that uh, by working with the systematic approach, you identify key actors, both public and private, and get support 
pos a possibility to build strength and endurance in the system, but also, which is important, I've heard it from the last panel and from our panel also, with, with, uh, with uh, the, both the private and the public system. So, so you can tap into resources, both intellectually, but also finance, uh, financial, so you can build a better sustainable platform for, for skills development. So it, it, you get both financial and, and intellectual and, and you, you get academic and what you have into to the equation. So you set the, and you also set it in the local context. So, so you, you get the possibilities to, to strengthen resilience and, and adaption in the, the local um, in the local context, which is really important. And then also with working with LKDF as a tool, you also take all the experience and build that and, 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 and take that to, to the platform. And, and, and so you don't work. I think it was uh, Antonio that said we should not work in silos. And this is the, the fine thing about working in this way, because we have the, the separate ongoing PPDPs in, in different countries, but you, but you, you take it up to, to, to a systematic level and look into them together and see where, where, where it works. And that is so important. And also what is important for us, as, as I said, putting the individual, as Fosida as a financer, putting the individual in the center is also, as Kirsten mentioned here with the gig economy and what we have in the world with refugees and everything and vulnerable groups, also to, to address them. And by making the, using the MSD approach and working systematically in the local context, you can address those issues too. And you can actually um, get these people, the, the, the people working in the informal sector, and so into uh, into the formal sector. So, so working with all, and, and I think here, uh, private sector is a, is a key to this. So working locally with local companies, but also with international companies, for instance, working in, in, in the countries where we are is so important. And this is one way to do it with the PPDPs and with the, with the market system development approach. Thank you. I can right, go thanks. on. <laughs> I can go further. No, it's fine. No, it's yeah. fine. We'll get you to go on uh, a little later when we come yeah. uh, when we come yes. back to uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the second round of questions. So, so, so it's it's really interesting as we as we talk about the um, importance, so that you uh, have you as you've highlighted the importance of public uh, private uh, partnerships. I think it's one of the um, areas in which some of the opening uh, commentators did mm, yes. emphasize as well a little yeah. earlier and. I know that uh, there's a lot of work that UNIDO does in this space in also trying to build uh, resilience, uh, not only at a workers level, but also uh, just looking at what can be done at a management leadership level. But just your take on resilience and how, how uh, UNIDO in itself is, is looking to play its part in increasing the level of resilience of, of the workforce. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I was wondering what can I add. So much has been said, uh, but at the yes. core uh, uh, of, uh, of 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 why do we are uh, why we're talking uh, about resilience? I think that we agree that there is disruption. I think a, a key key element is disruption, because when I heard the idea of 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 bouncing forward, I like it. But behind that, we need to think that resilience has to do with reinventing yourself, reinventing your organization, uh, reinventing the, the, the in coming back, but in a new way. And therefore, I think a key element that uh, we should take into account is innovation, innovation and moving forward. But yes, uh, I agree that we have been in, in, in a turmoil already in an accelerated change that did not come with COVID, that did not come with uh, climate change. It came with the all, all other elements of technological transformation, digital transformation, and looking into the future, uh, the imperative of the digital, uh, the twin transformation on green and digital. Uh, so these are very important reasons why we are looking into the need to be prepared, to be prepared to the unexpected, but this is not enough. Uh, emergency preparedness is not enough. You need to be able to, to 
to reinvent and come back uh, later and prioritize immediately uh, this uh, new situation and the long-term resilient. And definitely skills are at the core of uh, uh, what uh, can be is an important tool. I believe standards are another important tool. We think in UNIDO, we have a definition, I may read it, the ability to anticipate, prepare for, respond and adapt to uncertainty, change and sudden uh, 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 disruptions in order to survive and prosper and ultimately achieve inclusive and sustainable development. But I would like to add to that what I see in, in, in the standard precisely, uh, in the ISO standard 22316, which is a standard on resilience. And, 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 and the standards is on resilience and security. And it adds to the elements I uh, have already put forward, something very, very important, good governance, good governance and management. Also, the, the, the idea that skills is not neutral. We need a diversity of skills. Yeah, We need to distinguish between uh, certain skills. Leadership is fundamental, knowledge and experience. Yeah, And this is important to, to this notion of uh, that Antonio used, that uh, uh, we have to deal with redundancy, but we have also to value experience. Uh, and last but not least, uh, certainly, there is a need to, to have a multidisciplinary approach. And mm -hmm. ultimately, it is uh, about all uh, uh, managing risk. Uh, it is about uh, risk, but the management of risk is, is, is the, the, the defensive part. We need to be proactive. And in UNIDO, uh, being the custodian of SDG 9, uh, we focus uh, definitely uh, on resilience building. Uh, and we, we focus on, on the organizational part. Yes, individuals, we are working through uh, precisely skills development, but it is about organizational re resilience. We are talking, and uh, Antonio addressed the issue of country resilience. He mentioned how many countries that uh, had already adopted and uh, absorbed technologies were in a better position to, to, uh, um, to bounce back. Uh, so, uh, uh, we have another element uh, that UNIDO is doing, and we, we do a lot through our activity programs to uh, uh, the, the institutions and uh, strengthening the institutions, but also we work very closely with the private sector. Yeah, And this is an, an important element, again, that I would like to bring in. Kirsten talked about uh, the networks. Uh, yes, we, we need to have better networks, but we need to have them in a certain governance. Another element that, that in UNIDO we look very much in relation to resilience and skills is the capabilities of SMEs, of small and medium-sized enterprises, because they are the ones that are less equipped to deal with risk. Yeah, uh, and, and, and here what we do is we, we, we know that SMEs are exposed to higher risk, so we need to, 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 to prepare them, but we need also uh, to help them to recover in the aftermath. Finally, um, uh, I, I have mentioned the need of, of management and leadership and the distinction of the different levels of skills. Uh, and certainly uh, before in the opening session, I heard that was uh, a lot of, of the different skills required uh, to deal with, uh, with crisis and with the unknowns. Uh, finally, to mention digitalization is also not straightforward. Uh, digitalization is a panacea, but you need uh, also even a basic foundational absorption capacity to absorb digital technologies, to absorb digital skills. If you don't have basic STEM uh, knowledge, you will not be able to uh, have more digital uh, knowledge. And uh, uh, finally, I think uh, Antonio elaborated it very nicely. We have in the flagship middle industrial development report uh, uh, exp ex explored and explained how uh, digitally enabled enterprises were better in terms of sales, profits, and also uh, limiting the job losses. So uh, these uh, technologies uh, uh, can help to accomplish uh, uh, some resilience, the SDGs, ISID, but in order to be there, you need foundational skills. Uh, let me uh, uh, leave it at that now. Thank you. Yes. And I just said that you also need access. Uh, you may have some of these foundational skills, but you just, as a, a small business even in particular, you'd need access 
to some of these uh, technologies that will help you be cutting edge and stay ahead and keep the number of people in your employ and keep continually improving their their skill set, which we know is also uh, a challenge for uh, SMEs. And it's very interesting, or I'm looking forward to seeing how uh, the world deals with this challenge as, as we do go forward. Uh, uh, Luca, uh, Francesca, I know that you guys have done some research just in the space, just looking at uh, resilience and skills from a holistic point of view, uh, looking at some of the policy, the ingredients there that needs to come into play uh, when trying to craft a framework for this. I'm hoping that you can just share some of the preliminary findings of that research with us. So Luca, just beginning with you, as we haven't yet heard from you. Yeah, thank you, Fifi. Um, so indeed, we have been collecting some evidence and reflecting quite a bit on the policy uh, sort of reactions that countries have deployed uh, during uh, the COVID-19 as the latest example of a crisis where, of course, resilience has, uh, you know, has emerged as fundamental. Uh, and so, so, of course, as you as all of you already know, the evidence is still incoming. So we are not uh, we are not yet uh, at the final uh, stage of our of our uh, collect data collection. But so there are a couple of lessons that perhaps are already quite well established that we can share. So the first one is that, of course, uh, skills have uh, sort of represented a, a fundamental dimension in explaining the labor market reaction um, uh, during during the COVID-19 crisis uh, in in multiple senses. So the first one is that the impact of the of the shock has been asymmetric depending on on skill uh, capabilities and educational uh, attainment. So uh, of course the low skilled have, su have suffered more than the high skilled on average across countries, and this, this is true. Uh, across developed and developing countries. Um, so uh, part of this is linked to, you know, to the nature of the shock. So some sectors and, uh, have suffered more than others, but the part of it is, is about the skill endowments of people themselves, the skill, the capabilities of, of, uh, of workers. And here I, I cannot but circle back to some of the uh, sort of uh, broader categories that have been mentioned of skills that have been mentioned already by by the other speakers. Uh, notwithstanding, I think the great point that Bernardo just made about uh, diversity of skills. Of course, we are we are drawing general lines here. I mean, we are you know I mean uh, heterogeneity is still always in the background, and we shouldn't forget about that. But so so to to so one of these general lines is indeed that uh, digital skills have been uh, absolutely fundamental in the moment of the crisis, which doesn't invalidate the point that, uh, you know, there needs to be some fundamental capabilities ahead of developing uh, digital skills, right? I mean, that was another of, of Bernardo points that is very well taken. But so digital skills, of course, fundamental. We have seen in it for the emergence of remote work. We have seen it for uh, sort of the intensity with which firms have switched to uh, e-commerce. We have seen it for uh, the building of further skills and, and training, which switched uh, massively online in the peak of the crisis. So, uh, so that's the first the first line I would want to, to point out to. The second one is about soft skills, of course, uh, and adapt adaptability. I really appreciated Antonio's in, you know, Antonio's point about. Uh, diversifying skills for robustness to shocks and, and skills for readiness to change further down the line. I wonder where soft skills would be put by him in this diversification feels as if they are fundamental in both phases. Uh, at least that's how uh, I think we, we think about it in the group. But so, and then the third point about, uh, so it's about the fact that uh, during the crisis, uh, sort of the propensity of people to train, and in particular, the propensity of firms to offer training went down quite a bit. Now, so we have only very descriptive evidence here and mostly from European labor for surveys, but we can we can say that essentially the participation to training went back if among workers, among the employed, went back to a level that we had seen around 2012 on average across different European countries. So, so effectively a bounce back of about 10 years. Now this could all be very temporary 
And there are several explanations, of course. Uh, part of it is social distances. Part of it is, you know, the, the firm foreclosures, uh, so mandated foreclosures. But part of it is actually the fact, even in sectors that kept on operating, this uh, sort of uh, propensity to offer training went down. And that's and we explain it, uh, for instance, in uh, uh, the fact that uh, there was a lot of uncertainty about the future. So firms were not necessarily able to understand where to invest or whether to invest. And uh, the fact that sort of uh, other investment may have taken priority, say, for instance, in implementing a digital infrastructure in the firm itself. Right. So so in, in, with a view to this sort of uh, three broad points, I think pol policy reacted uh, pretty promptly in several ways. I mean, I don't have the time to to uh, sort of describe all of the of these, but perhaps one and per perhaps the most innovative way was the, the development of rapid reskilling uh, programs. Uh, that meant effectively what we usually targeted to essential employers. That meant effectively the, uh, the possibility to retrain very fast the unemployed, first of all, but also those who became uh, unemployed uh, on because of the COVID-19 crisis, so that they could uh, sort of be, uh, empl you know, find new job, find jobs in uh, essential essential services. Uh, how does that? How did that uh, sort of uh, deploy itself? Well, it, it was several several different aspects. I mean, uh, first of all, um, countries developed the ability some some services to assess the skill needs in a faster way than they usually do. This is often uh, this was often carried out by the public employment services that invested quite a bit on online on online capabilities. So uh, the, a second fee common feature was the fast tracking. Uh, approval of uh, new curricula, often online uh, training curricula that uh, uh, enabled the fast reskilling to happen in the very first place, including uh, via different uh, teaching methods. And uh, sometimes uh, for those countries who, who had the, the sort of financial resources, the deployment of specific training uh, directly uh, sort of provided by, by governments, in particular for hard hit sectors. And that's, I think, the, 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 those are the main points uh, that emerge yes, the immediate uh, the immediate response. The immediate response. Um, uh, Francesca, your key takeaways uh, here, and uh, perhaps maybe speaking more to uh, the, the more longer term responses uh, as proposed by the research in, in coming from an event like the, the pandemic and building better resilience for a future uncertainties? Yes, thank you very much. Very often we are asked about uh, the priorities. So should we, when we talk to governments, uh, should we put in place uh, quick wins uh, because job seekers are knocking at our door or should we rather focus on the long-term uh, strategies and policy actions? And the answer there is that uh, there is no room for priority. Both are very much needed. And of course, uh, we see that we work also under constant pressure. There is a sense of urgency dictated by different events but i i think that uh, the, the the current uh, political situation geopolitical uh, situation should not hamper the long-term change in the country the two really have to go uh, hand in hand um, and we spoke before about resilient labor markets and resilient systems and resilient people uh, but to prepare these resilient systems and people um, countries really need to build an anticipatory uh, culture and when it comes to skills um, what we see across country is that uh, um, there is a need to work on skills intelligence skills anticipation to allow individuals and country to grasp the opportunities um, offered by the changing context the changing labor markets opportunities exist are out there but people need to 
need to really understand where these opportunities emerge. We know all very well that education and employment have different timing. The labor market needs something today. Education system needs much longer time to prepare young people or people in general to be ready uh, to respond to those needs. And anticipation can partially fill that gap. Um, skills intelligence is uh, one of the key pillars of the EU new skills agenda and tools to anticipate skills needs uh, such as the set of skills panorama or other tools implemented by member states uh, are key to anticipate skills needs. And I can tell you that also beyond uh, the borders of the European Union in the countries where we work, uh, there is also very high attention on uh, anticipation system. And for instance, foresight methodologies are used to scan the different drivers of change to anticipate emerging technology and see the impact that this technology can have on new skills needs or also to anticipate developments and prepare for the new opportunities earlier and more effectively. And the number of tools are used, traditional data, traditional sources of data, and also more innovative sources such as big data. Big data are widely used uh, across countries now through the analysis of online job vacancies, for instance, but also um, other types of big data such as the one coming from the web. Social media have been widely used or also, you know, international registries such as uh, uh, patents, international publication through the use of text mining techniques. So within this context, uh, in the uh, like in a vision of longer term measure, I think that there are two key dimensions that have to be assessed. On the one side, the foundation and the soft skills. On the other side, the, edu the initial education and also the upskilling and reskilling pathways. So we talked before about the perma crisis, the permanent crisis that we are all, all facing. Um, and when we talk about systems that face crisis, we also need to prepare people who are um, flexible enough to navigate through these different crises, that are flexible enough to go from one job to another. And in this respect, key competencies are key. And we have seen it through, through the pandemic very clearly. Uh, individuals uh, had to build solid foundation skills. Those who had uh, solid foundational skills uh, were the ones who could navigate uh, the crisis much better. At the same time, it was also clear that the soft skills pay, played a key role. Adaptability, flexibility, learning to learn. These were really key aspects that helped the people navigating through the crisis. And also we saw, and I think it's important, Important, especially in the framework of this UNIDO um, event, we saw the, um, the, the key importance of entrepreneurial skills, for instance, as in the case of the many workers or em employers who had to transform the, their businesses and their models, or even to create new products to navigate through the crisis. And be aware that the employer uh, were totally agreeing with this, with this. We carried out last year a survey with UNIDO uh, to see uh, how employers saw the crisis and they saw skills as the major factor for resilience and change management and they man they mentioned uh, digital skills, e-marketing but also creativity, design thinking as the skills that could allow them to really grow through the crisis. But on the other side the, the pandemic also showed that there are new emerging opportunities in different economic sectors and people have to be prepared for these different opportunities. We carried out uh, in ETF a number of studies on new emerging skills needs in different uh, sectors. For instance, uh, in the issue, I mean, in issues related to greening, and we saw that uh, uh, the green transition is bringing new emerging green occupation, but also transforming overall all the jobs. So jobs will become uh, overall greener and then you need to train and to prepare your people accordingly. Um, this highlights of course the need to have a permanent uh, monitoring system in place that enables countries and individuals uh, to really adapt constantly their curricula and make initial education more relevant to the needs of the labor market. At the same time, and uh, I conclude here, these information are really essential for the current workers. If all jobs are changing, 
it means that also the workers of today have to adapt their um, their skills and what we have seen in the studies is that change as i said before will happen across all occupations there will be broader profiles needed we talk about broader craft people you know i'm not only referring to high tech uh, jobs and we also saw that the inter uh, interaction between uh, different disciplines becomes the rule and in these uh, in this context uh, there is a very strong implication for upskilling and reskilling of all workers um, regardless of their skills level and i really believe that these upskilling and reskilling if i can say so a more democratic upskilling and reskilling for all will be the real challenge that all the countries uh, i mean transition country developing countries but even developed economies will have to face in the future yeah, just on a practical example on what you uh, have said, uh, particularly regarding upskilling and reskilling, there is a uh, individual I know who's currently a radiographer, one of these really in demand critical uh, jobs. But nonetheless, this individual is studying coding. One of the disciplines that we are told is going to be a discipline that's relevant today and will be relevant again in future. And uh, he, unfortunately, is unable to take leave, study leave, from his current place of work because his employer is of the opinion that coding is not a discipline that's aligned to his existing job. Just putting out there some of the difficulties that uh, certain individuals could face in trying to upskill or reskill themselves from an employment point of view. And another uh, takeaway from your uh, example of, of some of the, the long and short term solutions that you highlighted, as you said that uh, the research showed that they, there wasn't necessarily a, a priority, a specific priority, everything was a priority. In terms of how the entrepreneurs reacted to the uh, COVID-19 crisis, I know another entrepreneur whose business was the school's business. And of course, we do know that education also was disrupted significantly. Learners couldn't go to school, um, had to stay home. Everything went online and it impacted his business. And he temporarily went into the manufacture of sanitizers at the time when sanitizers and masks and all of that was a thing. And it was interesting to see that that temporary shift did help him you know, put bread on the table for that short moment of time. And now what he has actually done is, is he's reverted back to the mainstay education business, given that uh, things have gone back to normal, as it were. So just adding a bit of color into uh, some of the research by uh, practical examples of, of individuals. But as we do move on with the conversation, just noting the fact that we are uh, running out of time, there is a question that has come from the audience, which I'm hoping that we can take right now. And uh, you'll recall, I think the, con the, the, the question is, perhaps directed to you directly, uh, or maybe this is something that you can weigh in on. It's just in terms of the relevance, how relevant do you think um, the overview and opportunity for people in more challenging contexts with high informality and low access to digital uh, technology is? So it's, I think it's speaking to what resilience looks like right now for the people who are marginalized and how that situation can can be better ameliorated. What's your take? Uh, th thank you very much. And this is a tricky uh, question, but, but still, I mean, this is something that we work on. Uh, I can mention because when we look when we look into the digitalization, for instance, CEDA is having a program where we work with the, the regulators in Africa. This is and uh, uh, working with our setup, how we develop the, the framework for digitalization in Sweden and doing a replication in other countries in their local contexts. And this is so important. And this has actually been taken up by the EU so they will take this system and go wider and broader and put in tens or hundred times money for this because it's so 
important to get the uh, the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure down, because uh, as we know, and we saw this in, in the COVID also, during the COVID pandemic, that some countries were able to adapt, and they were able to adapt maybe in, in, in the major cities, but out in the countryside it was more, more troublesome, and you have refugees and you have margin, uh, marginalized um, people and, uh, and um, groups in the society that don't have access. So that is really something that CEDA is working with, and I know globally we are doing it together with other partners, of course. But that And that is one thing, getting people the access and the ability and the possibility to use the, the tools that are there uh, and get the information about uh, what is there for them. So that is one way of working with this. And then we have, uh, we, we, we support, for instance, with the work bank to, uh, together to work in refugee camps to get to get people uh, that are for instance refugees from Syria that are in 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 uh, uh, in, in the Middle East in, uh, in different countries but this has also been duplicated now to Africa where we have permanent uh, migration streams and you have refugees that are not longer refugees because they, they are they, they are staying in the countries and to get them into to work and, and skill and skill them to, to get them to be skilled workers and and find opportunities for them also is so important and and this is something that that uh, we are looking into it's so important on that there you also have the nexus i mean you have you have the humanitarian side and you have the development side to to get that together because we see that it's more and more permanent uh conflict is causing more and more permanent uh, um, establishment of, of, of refugees in, in different countries. So yeah. that was not the full answer, but a bit of the answer. Thank you. Yeah. No, <laughs> definitely. And uh, to, to the point and to emphasize the importance of that access, because it's uh, argued that in areas whereby you have some form of um, economic disruption, like a war, the importance of uh, online teaching tools to ensure that uh, teaching can continue even if students can't show up physically. But that can only happen, of course, if there is access and there's that infrastructure that you talk about to enable that. But we're bringing this conversation home right now and just getting into uh, the second round of, of questions, just trying to uh, wrap up everything that has been said so far. Quite a lot has been said around resilience and what resilience means just within the context of the skills revolution and the change that is happening to the labor market, driven by technology, driven by uh, the climate, driven by economic uncertainties. And therefore, I'd like to ask you just within the uh, this context, how within your individual organizations and within your individual roles, you think we can be better prepared for the skills revolution within your individual uh, institutions, perhaps what, what can be done differently as we try to uh, accelerate and perhaps amplify the level of response currently uh, underway? Kirsten, perhaps you can come in here. What, what's happening at the GIIZ in this, in this regard for preparedness and uh, increasing resilience around the skills revolution? So thank, thank you so much, Fifi. So GIZ is doing a lot of work on, on skills, on vocational training. Um, uh, but maybe because I think there's a wish also to give some more concrete examples, let me try and zoom in again on, on the gig economy and on digital labor platforms. Because as we said earlier, this is where we kind of see some trends going on and where we can also learn some things that are going to shape other sectors and other types of learning in the future. And we all know that the characteristic of the skills revolution is a rejection of traditional degrees and occupation requirements in favor of more like applicable practical skills. And um, so one project we're doing, which kind of picks up what one Francesca mentioned, it 
in terms of skill anticipation is to develop a skill compass, which will actually data scrape the biggest freelance websites to provide information on the real time needs. And so this can inform those that will seek to upskill themselves and reskill themselves now with clear trajectories as opposed to vague future and more general future trends. So they will know um, if I have certain skill sets, where is the highest return on investment? If I acquire the next skills um, based on the current demands, but also based on the skills they already have. So if they already know a certain programming language, what other coding language will be useful for them based on the demand and based on what they already know and have. And it will also allow policy to be more evidence-based because we will see clearly there what the trends are and will be more um, able to anticipate those trends and then um, develop trainings that accompany these and also in support with the companies because as also Ulrika mentioned and others mentioned it's really important we involve the private sector here. Another thing that at GIZ we're working on is the topic of micro-credentials as kind of an alternate pathway uh, to acquire new or recognize existing competencies. Also with the idea that the classical education um, usually takes a long time. And with micro-credentials, people can acquire and certify skills, very practical short-term needs in a, in a quicker and more flexible way, in addition and in complement to existing and traditional education systems. And so we are zooming in to better understand what those micro credentials can actually offer to gig workers and how they can use them. And we also want to develop a platform for these workers to inform themselves about uh, micro credential. And I think here also a future idea for us will be to further involve the private sector. So to develop uh, these things in partnerships with platforms, we're already starting discussions here. And also to think about who could be offering these micro credentials and badges and that that could actually be also workers working on these platforms themselves. And so in addition to work on the on the micro credentials and on the skill compass, um, as I said earlier, we think that trainings are important and networking import opportunities and mentorships. We really need to cater to the needs of workers and have very specific trainings also based on the needs we see and that those need to be trainings in very specific technical skills, but also trainings that focus on soft skills. So this the, the importance has already been mentioned a lot of times because they really complement and augment technology. And that we also need to focus on the more disadvantaged workers. And there we need to complement the trainings with, with mentorship, with networking opportunities, because especially in these new types of work, when, when work is mostly done remote or as single contractors, people get more isolated and they miss those networks and they are very important for resilience as we said earlier. The last thing I wanted to mention, Fifi, also going to the question you asked earlier in terms of, but 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 who's in charge of this constant reskilling? Are we giving that whole load and responsibility of loading it on the workers in some ways? Um, so for now, we see that in terms of the gig economy, we see that some digital labor platforms offer trainings. They do so notably where the labor supply lacks the skills that they need. Um, but we also see that because most workers are hired as independent contractors, they're also the ones who are often alone responsible for organizing and paying for their training and to be constantly alert and continue because they're kind of their next income will depend on this. And so we think that there's a role for regulators here and we need to build their capacity as well to look closer and make sure that workers have all the support they need and that they're not left on their own. And we know that especially this phenomenon of digital labor platforms, there's a need also for regulation to adapt to this new phenomenon because the classical labor laws and how responsibilities were divided previously do not necessarily apply. So this is why we're also taking this up. We're currently developing a course for policy makers on regulation of the gig economy and we're taking the topic of skills and regulation with regards to skills up as an important topic that policymakers need to look into mm. yeah I, I'd also, I, I, I'd, thanks thanks so much Kristen I'd also be interested in finding out so perhaps there are some uh, employers on the call with us today and what the response to micro credentials is like 
from the private sector right now, just particularly, I mean, from an African context where right now, still today, there's more emphasis that is placed on your conventional and your traditional degree or qualification. And I'm wondering how the uh, market, the labor market is responding to micro credentials right now and whether there is a premium or weight that has been placed on it. Uh, Antonio, uh, coming from a traditional institution, a little bit, but just, just, just uh, as we wrap up the conversation, your take on on how we can do better in showing up and preparing better for the skills revolution and improving resilience. Thanks, Hilti. Thanks, and I think this conversation has been extremely inspiring from from many point of view. Let me just start from a from a big question. I think when we talk about digitalization, we need to understand digitalization for what, right? In what direction we want to have this transformation? This transformation, it's not neutral and do we want to have more gig economy type of configuration? Or do we want to have organizations that can use technologies to have better type of jobs and that, that different type of employment? So we have to ask some big questions. And also we need to understand what is to have a sort of reality check about what is really happening, especially in the global south. With colleagues in uh, the uh, Universidad Federal de Rio de Janeiro, the University of Johannesburg, also in collaboration with UNIDO, we've been conducting extensive surveys with hundreds and in total thousands of firms who are actually engaging with digitalization and we are trying to understand what does really mean for them how much they are really involved because ultimately skills make sense and digital skills make sense if we can actually uh, have productive organization who can use them in a in a, in a productive way in a, and create good job opportunities and what is remarkable here is that when we look at specifically what firms are doing both in terms of technology adoption and in terms of changing their business models uh, not just in the global south, but also in the global north, especially small medium enterprises, are still at the very early stages of this revolution. So we need to also be careful in not just jumping two steps ahead, and we need to go through that process, which is a revolution in the making, if you want, right? We are seeing something happening in the making. And this transformation, it's what I see being particularly important here, is that in many cases, the skills that we are talking about are uh, not more are, of course, are in some cases foundational skills, but in many other cases are also new type of skills that actually reflect the nature of the new technology. Lots of the digital technologies are not new per se. I mean, we have been using 3D printing from the 90s. We have been robotizing the automotive sector, chemicals and so on from the 60s, 70s. What is new is the fact that in many cases, these technologies are now integrated. They are fused into new technology systems that require fundamental different type of skills to be run effectively. And so if you think about the what people call the green digital twin, right? If we want to run diffused energy system with renewable technology at the core, which potentially also create a fuel for green hydrogen and other technology, now we are talking about almost new science areas, right? Our new technology areas. So how the skills training catch up with this fundamental change in the nature of the technology means rethinking, of course, the way in which the institutions uh, 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 define curricula, how they work with uh, different type of uh, stakeholders, but also how do we finance this institution to make this up? We need to go back to the reality of many of vocational training institutions, which many particular low middle income countries have a very limited resources. These limited resources are always uh, very much uh, stretched between two different alternative goals. In many cases, they are trying to include people. They are trying to, uh, you know, uh, create a more pathways for uh, young people to get some basic skills. And on the other hand, now they are asked also to create most advanced skills, right? So you are facing lots of challenges in terms of addressing these new demands, while at the same time, the you know, responding to more to traditional uh, uh, needs uh, of basic skills and foundational skills. And at the same time, given that these technologies raise the capability threshold, if you want, they require more systemic, more cross-cutting, more cross-sectoral type of knowledge and understanding of the technology, we also need to think about how do we not simply work on vocational training and the financing of that new model of delivering this kind of training. A very concrete example, in many African countries, you have skills levies who are uh, 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 specific taxes attached to payroll of companies to finance trade. Is this a model that actually delivers or doesn't deliver? Uh, does discourage formal employment or encourage uh, formal employment in investment skill? How can we realign the incentive creating 
uh, various forms of grants, subsidies, industrial policy that actually align the interests of the firms and the firms who are capable to do the job of training. The second bit I would like to emphasize is that the nature of this technology is such that we need to think also how to start building up public infrastructure that support the retrofitting of companies and the absorption of these technologies. When you work across many uh, African countries, Latin America, but also Southeast Asia, you see a lots of companies needs access to lots of uh, 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 technologies that are, for example, data analytics or uh, pilot lines to test new uh, components, new uh, uh, solutions. And these type of things, especially for small and medium enterprises, are extremely costly. So if the government doesn't take an important role here in creating this public infrastructure that actually provide technology services, extension services, access to pilot lines, we might find it very difficult to see uh, this technology diffusing across local uh, uh, economies and small and medium enterprises. And this is becoming very, very important because skills alone and putting all our emphasis just on individual skills by potentially miss this more systemic firm level uh, capabilities that need to be built in, in order to absorb uh, skilled people in the labor market. And just finally, we have very good example of things that are happening and where companies are actually relying on this infrastructure to test, for example, uh, I've been working many years, I'm affiliated at the University of Johannesburg, you go in the mining equipment uh, uh, cluster in Gauteng and you can see that companies are trying to use new sensor for predicting maintenance to reduce waste in the mining sector, right? So you are aligning here digital, you're aligning green and reduction of uh, uh, material waste, and you are aligning that with skills. So I think we need to have more cases of this type where companies, public institutions, skills, triangulate and find solutions to the most pressing challenges that we are facing. All right. Thanks. All right. So, so uh, thanks everyone for the contribution so far. I hope our attendees are still uh, with us. We had quite a lot of active engagement at the start of the program. Please uh, do feel free to continue actively engaging with us, uh, asking any questions which we'll take throughout the uh, the program as the, uh, the the topic is really weaved into one overall theme. And Antonio, just to get to your um, uh, point, to respond to the point that you made around um, the financing challenge and what that, how that's a bit different in, um, in an African context or a developing society context. I was reading research from uh, asset managers and where asset managers are um, putting capital in right now in within the ESG framework. And the research was arguing that in an African context, less money is going towards uh, financing climate, not necessarily because of the uh, the returns element or the lack of awareness of climate, but because in an African setting, uh, societal and economic challenges were seen as a lot more pressing. So just uh, trying to um, add to the uh, point that you were making around this financing of adaptation and resilience, which I think is quite an important one. And I mean, Kirsten had said that in the gig economy, it was the individuals who were responsible for upskilling and paying for that upskilling. But how many people are in that uh, position, particularly permanent workers whose uh, salaries may have remained stagnant? throughout this time and I'm hoping that we can get more engagement a little bit later throughout uh, the, uh, the the two days on the issue of financing we want to uh, we see the skills revolution is coming we've been preparing for it but it's going to need a lot of financing and who who's there to plug the hole maybe you Bernardo maybe some of your friends in the the organization just uh, your 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 take on the skills revolution and how we can better prepare for it and better become resilient sir Unmute. So thank you, thank you so much. And and I, I, I like the idea of, of the need to put an emphasis on infrastructure, which is fundamental. It is fundamental when we talk about the informal sector, as uh, Ulrika did, connectivity is fundamental. You cannot deploy any of the technologies without having uh, basic infrastructure in place. We have uh, many examples where even we had well advanced uh, uh, traceability system. We tried to, to, to do it in, with blockchain in Ghana. It didn't work uh, because the connectivity is just uh, not there. And if the connectivity is not there, you cannot move forward. But if we look at the companies, the question is what type of frameworks and what type of infrastructure they need. And they need an institutional infrastructure. They need an ecosystem that will support them. Uh, 
uh, because companies are changing. They have to change, they have to adapt. Uh, they need to uh, get uh, risk management practice, but in particular, they need business continuity approaches uh, to convert also to these digital technologies. And for that, they need to, uh, uh, let's use again, the, the change of the skills. I don't want to use neither reskilling nor upskilling, but they need a change of the skills uh, they need. We have been working on, on, on this uh, level, the organizational entity called company enterprise, in order to provide them with uh, the tools. And a, a powerful tool to do that is through standards, because during the pandemic, we had uh, a, a very good publication on MSMEs, uh, helping them for business continuity. But in order for them to absorb them and then recovery, they need a foundation, they need also infrastructure, and then they need a management system. And this management system can help them to introduce risk management. So I, I, I reiterate uh, the, this aspect of the need to have foundation at the level of the individuals so that they can absorb. You need foundation at the level of enterprises. And in order for the enterprise to benefit from this, uh, they, they need to, to have this uh, ecosystem. Uh, let me just uh, finalize by mentioning one aspect that didn't come uh, yet, but we talked a lot about uh, digitalization, which is cybersecurity. I think it is very important when we do the effort to digitalize either individuals, informal sector, small companies, or companies, uh, we need to take into account that th there is a big threat. Imagine what it means for a small company to lose part of their business because something goes wrong at the digital level. So this is a very important element that we need to bring into the discussion that is also depending on certain skills. Thank you so much. All right, uh, definitely. And it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's a really important and a, uh, an economy with quite a lot of opportunity, right? So you, you, you teach people to be cyber criminals you have to, so that they can detect criminal activity on those who are trying to uh, uh, infiltrate the, the, uh, the, the, the internet and company systems, as it were, for, for the negative. You treat those to do it to stop those, those guys. It's, it's wonderful. Fingers crossed that um, the good guys don't eventually want to cross the floor and become one of the not so good guys. Jokes aside, we are uh, out of time for this panel, but I thought that just a key takeaway from each of you in a sentence, if possible, a sentence maybe to the same characters of a tweet, if possible, um, on what your expectations or your key takeaway uh, of this two-day event, what you want to leave the audience with being a message from your respective organizations. And Luca, I'm gonna begin with you. Just one key takeaway you want to leave us with. Yeah, so connecting also to the last part of our conversation, I would say uh, resources are uh, fundamental, but not enough. So it's not all about the money. Uh, there needs to be, uh, as Bernardo mentioned, uh, an ecosystem that goes, that supports both firms and individuals in understanding their opportunities, uh, the, the opportunities that exist and uh, do it right for the future. All right. Not all about the money. Francesca? Well, if you ask me one key thing, I would tell uh, skills, skills, and skills, of course. Uh, skills are really the best uh, buffer to navigate through crisis and through uncertain times. Uh, we don't know what the future will be like. We have some elements to predict uh, some parts of the future, but nevertheless, uh, the skills we equip people with are the one that will allow them to really go through these uh, difficult or like uh, uncertain times in a smooth way. All right. So skills, the best buffer to, un to navigate through uncertainty. Ulrika? I'm thinking here, so I'm going to take Lucas. It's not all about the money into, it's all about the money, because I come from the financial sector myself, so before joining CEDA. So I think looking into the Addis agenda, we haven't talked about that, but, but tapping tapping the, the private sector on, on financing is crucial because development money cannot do this. Uh, so that is one thing. And also the systematic system approach in, in, in addressing 
addressing uh, um, uh, challenges and, and opportunities on the local level, but also in the global level, taking from the global, working in the local level, so to, to get to get it to, to, to the communities and the individuals on ground. That was more than a tweet, but thank you. Okay, no, that's perfect. So I'll make it a tweet. It's not all about the money, but you can't do it without the money. I think we're safe there. Kirsten, your last words, ma'am. So I'd, it's hard to summarize this, this fascinating panel and there's gonna be more discussions today. So hard to predict what's gonna come. But I would say like, if, if you want me to sum it up in a tweet, don't leave the workers alone. Um, so to say that that there's so much pressure on upskilling and reskilling, and I think as Francesca said, that's key and very important. But workers cannot do that alone, and they need the resources, but they also need the regulation and the structure to divide responsibilities and to clarify and to have opportunities to do so and to know about those opportunities and be able to access them. All right. Don't leave the workers alone. Antonio, I can see by, and, and Bernardo, by your, uh, your hand gestures, you're really thinking about this, which means that your takeaways are going to be hot. They're going to be, going to be Very short. I think we need to move from uh, big uh, picture stories to build the coalitions of the willing of the or coalitions of interest in specific contexts to start implementing feasible solutions. Uh, and these solutions are going to be incremental solutions, are not going to be a revolutionary one, but will allow us to see change and demonstrate that change is possible in this area. So building coalitions. Okay. And essentially what you're saying is less talk, more action. Bernardo, the final word to you, sir. Yes, I, 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 I'm trying to summarize. And what we are uh, discussing is that people have to be at the center of any transformation. Yeah. But we need a holistic approach and take all the players into account. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll make that um, the last word, because essentially none of us can do it alone. No organization, no individual, no business. And uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely about everyone uh, and all hands on deck doing this together. Uh, to all of you, thank you so much for your time. I mean, we've had such a wonderful feedback from the attendees who say that this discussion has been really interesting uh, for them and uh, very educational and very wonderful. So thank you uh, definitely for providing insights uh, to a lot of people into what is a very important theme and uh, a theme that will require a whole host of, host of action and a whole host of stakeholders on board. I mean, it's so interesting. We even have Wale coming back. Yeah, I just tried to stick back in there to, to get some, to chime in a little bit. A really great closing statement by everyone there. Um, I've, I've learned a lot and uh, I think they've really helped us appreciate what's at stake here and what's possible. And the messages have been great. So well done to the panel. Can we can we applaud on virtual things? Let's applaud for ourselves. Yes, so I think please, if you're up there, uh, you can just use emoji <laughs> to appreciate the panelists in the chat. But I thought that was great. Awesome. Okay. Wonderful. So, and I think that everyone, the speakers especially, and but definitely the attendees, everyone needs a bit of a comfort break right now. Stretch the legs, grab your coffee, because we do have another session that is that is coming up. Uh, in fact, we've got lunch right now. Isn't that correct, Wale? Yes, we are breaking for lunch, so we're gone for an hour, and um, we'll see you back here in just about an hour, and that should take us to about, I think that will be 13.30 CEST, so yes. please do your best to join us for that, and um, I would be having the pleasure of engaging another great panel as we dive a little deeper into TVET, Technical Vocational Education and Training. I think that's a big part of what we're talking about in terms of building resilience. So we're gonna be breaking that down in the context of the Tibet uh, practitioners, so to speak, and what's the role of governments and policymakers, and what's coming next? How do you how do you deal with challenges? Because they are certainly gonna come. So I look forward to that and um, enjoy the break. Yeah, see you in an hour.